Welcome to you to this service for the first Sunday in Lent, coming to you from St. John's Episcopal Church in Halifax, Virginia. I'm the rector, Tim Jones, and I'm delighted that you are joining us via this virtual service during this particularly significant season. Our service will begin in moments in the Book of Common Prayer on page 355, and our hymn will be hymn number 135, Songs of Thankfulness and Praise. Also, a new class series will begin this weekend called Hands-On Spirituality, Staying Connected to God During Everyday Life. Again, the Book of Common Prayer on page 355. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. His mercy endures forever. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose blessed Son was led by the Spirit to be tempted by Satan, come quickly to help us who are assaulted by many temptations. And as you know the weaknesses of each of us, let each one find you mighty to save. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from Genesis chapter 9. God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you. For all future generations, I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth, and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you, and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. The word of the Lord. The psalm is found on page 614 in the prayer book. We will begin and end with the refrain. Your paths, O Lord, are love and faithfulness to those who keep your covenants. Psalm 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. My God, I put my trust in you. Let me not be humiliated, nor let my enemies triumph over me. Let none who look to you be put to shame. Let the treacherous be disappointed in their schemes. Show me your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. In you have I trusted all the day long. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and love, for they are from everlasting. Remember not the sins of my youth and my transgressions, Remember me according to your love and for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Gracious and upright is the Lord, therefore he teaches sinners in his way. He guides the humble in doing right and teaches his way to the lowly. 
All the paths of the Lord are love and faithfulness to, these, to those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. Your path, O Lord, are love and faithfulness to those who keep your covenants. The second reading is from 1 Peter chapter 3. Christ suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is eight people, were saved through water. And baptism, which is this prefigured, now saves you, not for, as a removal from, of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who had gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, with authorities and power made subject to him. The word of the Lord. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, 
proclaiming the good news of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. The gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Greetings to you on this first Sunday in the season of Lent. As I look out my window, I see ice on the trees. Uh, definitely a wintry, wintry Thursday morning. Well, some years ago, I heard someone tell her story at a small group meeting at a church, a church I was a part of. As, as a young person growing up, she recounted, I was active in my Methodist church and the youth group that met there. I thought I would keep rules and try to be a good church girl, and then God would help me with my life. He'd be there to smooth all the edges and just generally take care of me. But then she said a campus group in college brought into her life people who seemed to have a more robust faith. She noticed that they saw God as more than a vague presence. And while in many ways her new college friends were ahead of her in their Christian commitment, they seemed at the same time humbler. They spoke of Christ's forgiveness in a way that seemed deeper, more intense, more heartfelt. They were more willing to use a word like sin when talking about their lives. They seemed more grateful to have experienced forgiveness. And she told us, those of us there in that small group, I've been tempted before to simply say, no one's perfect. Christ died for sins, but I didn't really see what Christ died for. But now, she said, I looked deeper and I saw my own heart, its slothfulness, selfishness, its capacity for vengefulness and jealousy. And she said, I learned to look to Christ for mercy. And my faith came alive. Well, we heard today in our reading from 1 Peter, Christ suffered for our sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. Graphic words, gripping words, but those words from the ancient New Testament letter may seem out of step with our times, archaic. Christ dying for our sins? Well, some might say that's okay for rural religion for roadside signs that proclaim Jesus saves. Talk of a cross and atoning death sounds like primitive religion, like ancient pagan gods needing to be appeased by a sacrifice. Haven't we grown out of that? And besides, why not just talk about a God of love? With our sophisticated worldview, why not just say, oh, God, God just forgives? that we worship a God who's always and everywhere telling us that we're okay, just as we are. Our readings for today suggest that the reality is more complicated than the pop culture version of God's love. I mean, that idea is hinted, hinted at by the second, the second word of our reading from the New Testament letter of Peter, that word, suffer, Christ, suffered, Peter says. Now, the Apostle Peter is writing to people who desperately need encouraging, people who are daily facing persecution, abuse, rejection, because of their faith there in the, in the, in the first century. These early Christians needed to find their footing again and again in the great Christian hope. They needed not only to be reminded to stand firm, they needed to be grounded again in the conviction that Christ suffered too, suffered for us, suffered for our sins. Now, we may suffer, of course, but then we recall that Christ suffered for us, and that makes a difference. Some early manuscripts have the word died for our sins instead of Christ suffered, and different versions opt for one or the other, but both get at the same thing. It was a suffering death 
that Jesus endured, or it was suffering that led to death. It was extreme. It was a love that was willing to die at great cost, in other words, because that's how deep that love was. That's how deep that love is. Our condition warranted more than a quick, oh, don't worry, more than saying, as one jaded commentator put it, of course God will forgive me. It's his job. It's more serious than that. That's something of what happens on the cross. Why there was a cross. God says something Something's gone very wrong. Sin has broken communion that we enjoyed. My ways, God says, have been ignored or disobeyed. And an insincere, a casual, oops, well, doesn't quite cut it. Even our best efforts to fix our condition and our situation won't do it. But God says in Christ, I will offer the costly means to forgive, to overcome the distance, to establish and reestablish communion. It's not easy, but I'll do it. So when Jesus, God becomes one of us, becomes one with us, and willingly says, I I I'll take it on, all of what it means to be human, including temptation and suffering and death, you can see why it may need to be more than, more complicated than a simple, oh, just forget about it. I mean, when we forgive evil done to us, when we truly forgive it, we don't excuse it. At least we shouldn't. We don't say, oh, it didn't matter. At least we shouldn't. No, we say, if only to ourselves, I'm, I'm offended. I'm disappointed. I'm hurt. I'm angry. We let the full effect of what was done roll over us, not repressing it, but processing it. To forgive someone in our human sphere is not sweeping it under some emotional rug, but looking at the harm done to us full on, and then at great emotional cost, give up. We give up exacting a price. You absorb the hurt in a way. You give up your right to retaliate. And this kind of forgiveness requires a kind of death, a death to your own entitlement, a death to your thinking that you could, that you can, that you should exact vengeance. That's why Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the 20th century German theologian and martyr said, True forgiveness is always a form of suffering. That's true, isn't it? For us. But let's take this back to Peter's letter, to our standing in the presence of God. God was willing to suffer for us, Peter tells us. That's the bracing news. That's the good news. And Jesus, in that passage from Mark, as he strides onto the scene, is announcing good news. As C.S. Lewis said, it costs God nothing, so far as we know, to create nice things, but to convert rebellious wills cost him crucifixion, cost the cross. And this kind of costly forgiveness defines Jesus' life. It wasn't just toward the end. His coming at all happened at great cost. We see this even at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Yes, he heard God's voice, as we heard from Mark, saying, when he was baptized, you are my son, the beloved with whom I am well pleased. Who wouldn't love to hear that from the lips of God? But immediately, Mark tells us, he was driven into the wilderness, tested and tried almost at the outset, already here. On this first Sunday in the season of Lent, we hear how he suffers for us, suffers for us. He who could have stayed in the heavenly realm within the intimate communion of the Trinity leaves it all behind to come into our midst, to inhabit our neighborhood, 
to dwell in our hearts. We see the drama heighten as we move through Lent. We see the suffering increase, especially when we come to Holy Week with the Last Supper on Monday, Thursday, with Good Friday, Stations of the Cross. We'll be doing that this year. We'll recall just how far Christ was willing to go, how willing he was to suffer, to die. And when Peter says he died, the righteous for the unrighteous, Peter tells us he did it once for all. He means the absolute certainty and sufficiency of what Christ did. So while it's serious, you never have to worry. You never have to second guess. You never have to be afraid. It's costly, but God covers it. It's done. God withheld nothing, not even self of his own self, not even his own son, that's not winking indulgence, but something better. It's costly love. Christ suffered for sins, Peter said, once for all, for us. And so, this Lent, we remember we're not perfect, and we don't have to be. We remember our imperfection, our sin, and call it that, even if it takes a season like Lent to remind us, a season that turns us to God, that immerses us in how much we need mercy in Christ. So this season is somber in many ways, serious, yes, but no season more saturates us in the loving mercy of God, mercy that we need, that God freely gives. Amen. Prayers of the people are found in the Book of Common Prayer, beginning on page 389. In peace, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the Holy Church of God, that it may be filled with truth and love and be found without fault at the day of your coming, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Justin, Archbishop, Michael, our presiding bishop, for Susan, our own bishop, James, bishop assisting, and Tim, our rector, for all bishops and other ministers, and for all the holy people of God, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who fear God and believe in you, Lord Christ, that our divisions may cease and that all may be one as you and the Father are one. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the mission of the church, the mission of this church, that in faithful witness it may preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the world, that a spirit of respect and forbearance may grow among nations and peoples, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those in positions of public trust, especially Joe, our president, Ralph, our governor, Dexter, our mayor, that they may serve justice and promote the dignity and freedom of every person, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor, the persecuted, the sick, all who suffer, those who suffer injustice, for those with the coronavirus, for refugees, prisoners, and all who are in danger, that they may be relieved and protected, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this congregation, that we may be delivered from hardness of heart and show forth your glory in all that we do. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who have commended themselves to our prayers, for neighbors, for our vestry, our lay leaders, for relatives, friends, and members of our parish, especially Brenda, Bob, Jamie, Betty, Bill, Susan, and Drew, Ruth, Tavares, Angela, Kathy, Edwina, Robert, Troy, Eddie, Jed, Baby James, Hilda, Sue Ann, 
and violent, that being freed from anxiety, they may live in joy and peace. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Give us grace to your, do your will in all that we undertake. For those serving in the military, Robin, Alex, William, Dexter, Jeremiah and family, Byron and family, and Jonathan, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For first responders, for all medical workers, for teachers, and for all who serve in law enforcement and their families, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who have died in the communion of your church and those whose faith is known to you alone, that with all the saints they may have rest in that place where there is no pain or grief, but life eternal, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Rejoicing in the fellowship of all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to Christ our God. To you, O Lord our God. Amen. Now we join in saying a prayer of confession as found in the Book of Common Prayer on page 360. During this time of Lent, a particular time of penitence, reflection on our lives, and a desire to make amends where needed, a prayer of confession is especially and wonderfully appropriate. And I hope, I trust, you'll use the time of silence before we uh, actually begin saying the printed part. I trust you'll use that as a time of reflection and uh, asking God to show you those places in your life that need perhaps amendment or his mercy and forgiveness. It's found on page 360. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor, beginning with a time of silent confession. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. We remember these words, often say them on Sundays. Words from the New Testament, particularly appropriate during this season of Lent, as we look ahead to the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God. And may those words inspire us to new and renewed generosity as we think about the work of the church and the kingdom of God in our communities and beyond. And now, the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Amen.